our beginnings. Um, I would like to welcome all those that are watching us online, because I know there are people who are watching online, and you are also welcome to ask questions on our Facebook page if you want, and at the end, we could try to answer those questions. So welcome again, and as I said, <coughs> in this series, <coughs> I am not interesting, I'm not interested in proving what I believe. In this series, I'm interested in trying to find out the truth, no matter what the truth is. If we don't want to find the truth, then we're just going to fool ourselves. When we're searching for answers, we always need to search for the truth, no matter what the truth is. Even if we don't like the truth, we still, still need to find out the truth. Because if we... <clears throat> just try to prove what we believe and not discuss the other option, we might not find out the truth. This, I, I really wanted to, do, to say this at the beginning so that we are not uh, you know, misunderstood in what we're doing. I'm not interested in proving creation. This is not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to look at the evidence and see what the evidence tells us. Is the evidence telling us that is more likely that we have a creator? Or is the evidence telling us that it is more likely that we evolved? I need to take that risk. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Uh, I hope you understand what I'm saying. If it is the truth that we evolved and we were not created, we need to follow the truth. I know that most of you will say, but we know that is not the truth. We know that the truth is that we evolved. And I respect that. But when I'm talking to people who don't necessarily assume that from the start. Now I'm talking to people who believe in God. I understand that. But when I'm talking to people who don't necessarily believe in God, or he, they don't assume that from the beginning, I need to make that assertion. I need to show the person that I'm talking to that I'm willing to go wherever the truth leads. Because this is what I'm asking for, for, my per, for the person that I'm talking to to do the same thing. Everybody is biased. You know, there is no such thing as complete objectivity. I'm objective. I'm not biased. No, there is no such a thing. But I recognize that I have bias towards the Creator. Some people have bias against the Creator. And that's fine, as long as you recognize it. And if the evidence points against your belief, you should be willing to reconsider your beliefs. I, I really needed to make this introduction because we need to be searching for the truth. <clears throat> that being said, that being said, let's look at the evidence. Let's see what the evidence says. And if you remember last time, we talked about abiogenesis. Abiogenesis means the transformation from no life to the first living cell, okay? And technically, <clears throat> when we talk about that, people will say that's not evolution. And that is true. Abiogenesis is not evolution because Charles Darwin, when he wrote his book, The Origin of Species, he started with the assumption of the first form of life. He did not try to figure out how that appeared. He just said the first form of life was there. Now let's see how that first form of life developed into the diversity we have today. Okay, so technically, that is not evolution. However, when we discuss the matter of origins, we need to address it. And the question is this. Do scientists know how life appeared? And the answer to that is no. They have absolutely no clue. It's not, it's not that they don't know. They have no clue. Of course, there are myriads of theories on how life could have evolved, okay? could have appeared. It could have formed in an RNA world. It could have formed on clay tablets, volcanic vents, and all that. But the key word in all of this is it could have, which means they didn't prove it. So when it comes to the origin of life, nobody knows. 
So the thing is, you cannot say, I don't need God. I don't need a creator because I proved that life could have evolved. You cannot say that because nobody proved it. They just assume, people who choose not to believe in a creator or a designer, they assume life evolved, life appeared on itself. And then they try to build on that assumption, which is a valid way to do science, but you cannot say you proved it. You just assumed it. <clears throat> okay, so in terms of the origin of life, scientists still don't know. Okay, That's, that doesn't prove the, it doesn't prove that life was created. It only proves that they don't know. And I'm going to talk about this at the end, why this is not an argument from ignorance. You know what the argument from ignorance is? I don't know how life appeared, so it must have been created. That's what they say, we say. Okay? But that's not the case, because the more we study about the origin of life, the more mysteries we find. It's not like we study, oh, and we figured out 5%. And then next year, we figure out 10%. And then until like, oh, we got like to like 85%. We still have a couple of things to figure out, but we basically know how it happened. No, it's not like that. They just assume some things might have happened, but that's not proof. So, and the more we study, the more we realize we don't know. Okay. Now, when we talk about the origin of life, Many people will say a simple form of life. This, 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 uh, this uh, syntax, a simple form of life. Well, that is an oxymoron. It doesn't exist. There is no simple form of life. The simplest form of life that we know is more complex than anything humans have ever created. The simplest form of life is more complex than a city. It has everything you find in cities. It has power plants. It has highways. It has trans a transportation systems. It has a guarding system. It has walls, gates, whatever you want. It is a very, very complex system. If you want to show that appeared by chance, you got you to refer to that, to this very, very complex system. The problem is, what I'm discussing today the things are getting even worse than that. So when we start, we don't start simple. We start very, very, very complex systems. And when you go to the evolution, things get even worse. Things are getting even more complex than that. Okay. <clears throat> the most success scientists have ever had in, in, the in the study of the origin of life is building with the building blocks. Remember amino acids, you know, miller urey's experiment? When he was able indeed to create some uh, amino acids, but the experiment was first not compatible with reality because geologists today do not believe that the primordial atmosphere was the one he used, but that's not even his major problem. His major problem is, <clears throat> okay, I'm going to name another problem, which is not even the major problem. Another problem is that there was a mixture of amino acids and other substances. So it wasn't a pure uh, amino acid uh, um, substance. The other problem is, you know, amino acids in the human body are left-oriented, left-handed. Let's put it that way. It's, it's about uh, optical isometry. It's complicated, but they're all left-handed. They can be right-handed and left-handed. They're all left-handed. In his mixture, they were both. There is no natural process capable of separating the left from the right. In every mixture that they create, it's always both. In life, there's only left. Why? We don't know. Maybe it's just the creator you know, having fun a little bit. I don't know. <clears throat> no successful experiments for macromolecules or organelles. You know, the biggest problem with his experiment is that it doesn't prove anything. Just having the bricks doesn't mean you proved how you build the palace. If you just build a brick, you still need a lot of energy and input and information to create the palace. And that's the, the, the biggest problem of abiogenesis, the origin of information. You remember how we said information is by definition arbitrary. 
You know, somebody needs to input meaning in, in it. It's not something that comes naturally. Like I showed the, all the, those strings of letters, and one of them was in Cantonese. If we don't know, then we don't know what it means. Apparently, some people in Southeast China assigned meaning to that, and it means, do you speak Cantonese? But to, to all of us, it doesn't mean anything. Information is, by definition, arbitrary. Somebody has to put meaning into it, into it to mean something. And I gave another example of another city from <clears throat> Eastern Europe that has a very bad connotation in the Romanian language. I'm not going to mention it, but that's the point. In a certain language, it's just a city. In our language, in Romanian, it's a very bad word. Because we assign meaning to those words. It's information is arbitrary. It has to be input there. And the only phenomenon capable of creating information that we know is intelligence. We do not know of any phenomenon, natural phenomenon, capable of creating specified complexity is the technical term. But we just use the term information. Although information can be de def defined in many ways, and in some ways you define it, it can be created by natural processes, but <coughs> specified complexity cannot be created, but only by an intelligence. So that's what we discussed last time. <coughs> now, things are getting even, give, getting even worse, because we were just talking about a single cell. Now, when we go to evolution, we have to explain increasing levels of complexity. Okay, we had the subcellular organelle and the cell, which are very, very complex in themselves. But now you have to explain tissues, which are even more complex than one cell. A tissue is not just a bunch of cells together. Oh, you have some cells, put them together, you make a tissue. No, they have to be put together in a certain way. It's, they combine different cells to make a tissue. It's not that simple. Then you have the organ, which is, again, a higher level of complexity. An organ is not just a bunch of tissue. An organ has to be put in a specific way. You have tissue, but you have to organize it in a certain way to get an organ. And then you have the living organism, which is the most complex things at all, from, from all of them. Human body, the human body is extremely complex. You, you see it... It has all kinds of contingency systems, redundancy systems. You know, it's very, very, very complex. You need to be able to explain that by natural means. So let's take a look at it. Let's look a little bit at how uh, modern science <coughs> purports that they showed how this appeared. Okay, Basically, most arguments regarding evolution are based on homology, okay? What does that mean? They look at organisms, <clears throat> they see that they resemble each other, and then the conclusion is, well, they must have evolved from one another because they resemble each other, okay? Homology, like uh, the, the classical example is the human hand, the mammal, forelimb, bat, uh, cat, and a, a whale they all have the same structure, and that is true. That is the fact, as we mentioned the first time we, we, we discussed about this. How if that is a result of evolution, or if that is the result of somebody creating them that way, that's the interpretation, okay? And m more recently, you have a, a more specified kind of homology, which is called cladistics. You might even hear that when you read newer textbooks, cladistics. It's a you know, technical term. We don't, we don't really like it, but it, it is what it is. They use it, so we must refer to it. So cladistics is what? It's a method of classification of animals and plants according to the proportion of measurable characteristics that they have in common. See, the same thing. They compare it. Okay? It is assumed, key term, it is assumed that the higher the proportion of characteristics the two organisms share, the more recently they diverged 
from a common ancestor. Now, does cladistic prove evolution? That's the key. No, it assumes evolution. That's the problem. Cladistic, when people try to see how organisms evolved from one another, they assume they evolved, and they just compare them and try to see how many uh, features they share in common, and then they draw a tree, and they say, oh, this, is, this organism is closer to this one than to the other one because it shares more characteristics with this one than with the other one. But if you try to use that to prove evolution, you get to a circular reasoning because that methodology assumes evolution from the start. Now, cladistics, it's a very legitimate way of doing science, okay? So within the, <clears throat> within the theory of evolution, they assumed that, and now they're just doing science, ba science based on that, and that's fine. It just doesn't mean it's necessarily true. I hope you understand the difference between scientific and true. They assume all organisms evolved from a common ancestor, and then they just compare them. Okay, and they say, this organism is more related to this one than the other one. Okay, so how can I falsif falsify that? You can't, because you just assumed it at the beginning that they evolved. So using cladistics to prove evolution is circular reasoning. Because in that thing, they assume it from the start. So you cannot use it afterwards to prove it. I mean, you can, but you'd be just committing the fallacy of circular reasoning. <clears throat> okay, let's go a little bit further with, with homology. Have you ever heard of this phrase? Again, it's, it was another key phrase in textbooks. It's a technical term, I give you that, but it's catchy. Okay, they say ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Basically, what this says <clears throat> is that embryos, when they develop, they pass through stages that are similar to organisms that that organism evolved from. So, a human in its embryonic stage goes through a fish, and then a salamander phase, and then a, ma and then a reptile phase, and all that. And what we have here are the famous drawings of Ernst Haeckel. Okay, it was an embryologist in the 19th, in the 18th century. <coughs> Sorry about it. <coughs> Sorry, in the 19th century, so in the 1800s, 1870s. And very interesting, he, he said, I'm looking at embryos, and in their earliest stage of development, they are very similar. Okay, so look at the bottom part. So what we have here, fish, salamander, um, I forgot what this is, a turtle, chicken, pig, cat, what is that? I don't see that, and this is a human. But in their early stage, he draw them, and he said, see, they are very, very, very similar. And even Charles Darwin called this the, mo the strongest proof of my theory. That's what he said. Now, technically, even if this were true, that doesn't prove evolution. It's just an interpretation. You think they look the same. When structures are in their most basic form, they look more the same. For example, if you take two cars that, that are very different, when you see just the body of the car, with no doors, no headlights, no, car, no wheels, no nothing, they look similar because they're in their most basic form. That's what would be happening here. However, Heckel's drawings were fakes. History of science proved that. It is sad that some textbooks still figure them as proof of evolution. They were blatantly fakes. No, there's nothing uh, less than that. He intentionally drew them to fit his theory. First of all, okay, so the drawings are fake. That's not even the first stage. He didn't even draw the first stage, okay? And the similar features that you see in organisms, and they come from sim dissimilar genes. They do not come from homologous genes. It's a whole different pathway that the embryo takes to get to the same structures. This is how they really look like. Where's my photo? Huh? Where's my photo? I gotta show you the photo, but not now. Okay. Um, 
I don't know why I don't see the photo. It's not there. Could you look in downloads, in the downloads folder, there's a photo there with two rows of embryos. And just show that if you can. I don't know why the photo's not there. Anyways. So the idea is this. He intentionally drew fake drawings because he just wanted the data to fit his theory. And people took it without even verifying that. You got it? Okay. Let's see it. Yeah, it's this one. Try to make it bigger. See, on the bottom is what Heckel, is what Heckel drew. On the top is how they really look like in that stage that he drew them. In. So you, you can see the differences are, 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 you know, you can see them with the, with, with the naked eye. The embryos at that stage do not look the same. Even if they did, there was not proof of evolution. But the reality is they don't. And the similar features that they try to explain now, because science has, has advanced, the scientists are able to tell they come on a different pathway. It's different genes responsible for the same features. If organisms evolved, why do they have different pathway to get to the same organ? It should have been the same genetic pathway. It's not. That's the reality. Let's get back to the presentation. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, so most arguments of, 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 of um, Evolution, they come in the form of uh, homology, similar features. And they say that is a proof of evolution. Well, that might also be proof of, of somebody created them the same way. Uh, the argument there is, well, a designer, a god, wouldn't have done it that way. Why? How do you know it? How God would have done it? Why wouldn't he have created them the same? With the same building blocks, he created this huge diversity. You do not know if he created them the same or not. And if we look at other creators like us, we see that we build and create that way. That is, we have a structure, and then we improvise on that structure, and we adapt, and we change, and we create different structures. But you don't create separate, completely different structures for everything. I mean, a building can take many forms but it has a similar pattern for more buildings. A car can take many forms, but there's a common pattern to all of them. That's how creators work. You invent something, and then you diversify it as much as you can. Why wouldn't a creator create it that way? Plus, that's not a scientific argument. How do you know? Okay, so let's go past this stage and go to the mechanism of evolution. The mechanism of evolution is, simply put, mutations and natural selection. Of course, there's many more, but because of the lack of time, we're just gonna, re we're just, just gonna talk about the main one, because they, um, evolutionists say this is the main mechanism of evolution. Basically, <clears throat> basically, what it means is that from a certain population, some organisms are born differently because of mutations. And because they're born different, okay, they have a different characteristic, that characteristic confines them some advantage. And because of that advantage, they can reproduce more successfully, and in time, they replace the whole population. That's basically the idea, you know. And the, 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 one of the examples is you have a population of, what, uh, deer, and if one of the deers is, is sick, when they're chased by wolves, who are the wolves going to eat first? the sick deer, okay? That preserves the health of the general population, and that is true. So now let's dissect this argument a little bit. First of all, mutations. Mutations are not positive. Most mutations are harmful, and the organism dies if you have that mutation. Some mutations are neutral. Just 
a small part, but there are no positive mutations. There are no mutations that offer the organism something better than what they had before. And there are several examples that they try to do to show that there are positive mutations. One of them is sickle cell anemia. Have you heard of the sickle cell anemia? So, you know, <clears throat> The cells in our body, they are responsible for carrying the oxygen, they're called the red cells, okay? And some people, instead of having normal red cells like these ones, see, these um, discs, they, because they lack something, the, the discs shrinks and becomes like a sickle. Where, where's my pointer? I don't have a pointer anymore. Oh, there it is. Yeah, so there it is. The interesting thing is, people who suffer from sickle cell anemia don't get malaria that often. Okay? They, they, they have this mutation that prevents them from getting malaria. And they say, see, that's a positive mutation. It improves the health of the population, so people who have this don't get malaria. Well, that is technically true. They do not get malaria, but that is definitely not something you want to have. You do not want to have sickle cell anemia. Yeah, that's, a very, that's a very dangerous disease. And it has many side effects. It has many things that happen, not side effects. It, has, uh, it affects the body in, 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 in very serious ways. For example, um, one of the ways it ha which affects the body is that these cells can build up and block the blood flow to organs and tissues. And that happens very often. Then they break up more easily. They only live 10 to 20 days versus 90 to 120 days which means you get less oxygen because you do not have the same number of red cells able to carry the oxygen that you need. Sickle cell anemia is a very serious disease. Now we're able to treat it and we're able to prolong the life of people who have that because of modern medicine. But if that happened before modern medicine appeared, most of those people would die. Natural selection will select against this. It will not select for that, even in parts of the world that have malaria. Because this kills more than the malaria. So that's not a positive mutation. It does confer some positive, it does confer some advantages, but they are minor compared to the disadvantages they bring. Natural selection would select against it. Let's see some other beneficial mutation, mutations. Now, the fruit fly has been the workhorse of geneticists. geneticists. You know, for a hundred years, they've been tormenting that poor organism in ways we cannot imagine. The fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster. Nice scientific name. And one of the mutations they were able to do uh, to replicate is they created a four-winged fruit fly. You see, uh, up here we have the normal fruit fly, and here they created a four-winged fruit fly. Wow, this fruit fly is faster, like Kevin likes to say, I'm faster. This fruit fly is faster, has four wings, more is better. So there you go, positive mutation. Well, reality is <coughs> those wings do not have any muscles attached. So they're basically they're, they're dead weight. So imagine flying a helicopter with four blades and flying with just two blades functional and the other two are like that. You won't be able to fly very, very far because this fly cannot fly as fast as the other ones because the two extra wings don't have muscles. They cannot move. Now, that's not even the worst part. The worst part is, is that normal fruit flies has some stabilizer right here. I don't know if you can see it, and they're very small. And these wings, they grow instead of those stabilizers. Those are very important for the flight of the fruit fly. It stabilizes its flight. It's able to take you know, the direction that it needs. It's like flying a helicopter without its tail rotor. It would just fly in circles. It would not be able to stable it itself. Okay? So these wings, they do not offer any advantage. Not to mention the fact that this is, a, this is actually three mutations. It's not just one mutation that was able to do that. So they were able to combine three mutations 
And that doesn't happen in nature because the other two mutations don't, don't have this effect on their own. So natural selection wouldn't have anything to select because that doesn't exist. You have to wait and combine in the lab three mutations to get that. And that doesn't exist in nature. But it doesn't even make something positive. That fruit fly only lives and mates because scientists in the lab make it. In nature, we wouldn't have been able to do that and pass along these three mutations, which wouldn't have been able to appear in the first place because you need the lab to do it. Second thing, fruit flies again. They were able to make a fruit fly with legs on its head instead of antennae. Uh, how, is that a, how is that an advantage? I give you that. It's an amazing feat of you know, technology. You were able to do that. But uh, why is that an advantage? I mean, the pure fr fruit fly, the, it needs its, its antennae. It, it needs to do, they do something. That are, their functional body parts replaced by a non-functional one. It does not need the legs on its head. So that is definitely not a beneficial mutation. Okay? So that's about mutations. Of course, there, and I just make a parenthesis here. <coughs> Um, I'm trying to present the most important parts of these things because there's so many things to say. We wouldn't have time, you know, hours. We're just going to talk about the first session that we talk if we want to discuss everything. So I'm just trying to make the, 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 the main landmarks in this discussion. And the idea is that there are no beneficial mutations. No matter how they spin it, there are no beneficial mutations. Most of them are harmful. Some of them are neutral, but they do not offer any um, be benefits. Now, natural selection. Let's go to a little bit to natural selection because they say the creative power of natural selection. Well, natural selection doesn't have any creative power because natural selection is best explained as passive elimination. It's not that the mutated organism is actively selected, but all the other ones are passively eliminated. That's the thing. That, that, that's the whole idea. For example, um, <clears throat> if, and I give you this, you have the fox, okay? You have the white fox. And <clears throat> this fox lives in areas that the polar facts where you have mostly winter. So its fur would camouflage it better than a fox that doesn't have it. So it is normal that if, if when, when that happened, we don't know when exactly that happened, but uh, there are always white foxes in, in the population, even in, in areas where you don't have winter, because that mutation exists. But they don't, they don't live to, uh, they don't, they're not very numerous in the population, because they, they do not have a lot of advantage, as in the polar regions. There, in the polar regions, they do have the advantage because they can camouflage better with the snow. So basically, when this first mutation appeared, this fox was able to eat better than the other ones. And in time, the other ones died because they didn't have a, a, as much food, but this one had because it was able to camouflage itself. So basically, natural selection, when the mutation appears, it eliminates the other. Just, just those things are eliminated. It's not that it actively promotes the one that is affected. It just eliminates the other. The mutation appears. The one process that should have the creative power is the mutation. But we just show that it doesn't have that. Natural selection just eliminates the others. It doesn't, doesn't create anything. Natural selection does not create. It just eliminates. Okay. Now, let's talk a little bit about the evolution of the eye. <laughs> we talked now, we talked so far about the um, general idea of evolution. Now, let's talk a little bit about organs. And I'm just going to choose the eye because the eye was the one organ that gave even Charles Darwin nightmares. And he acknowledged that, that he couldn't think of how that could have evolved, okay? Because um, <clears throat> the eye is very, it's a very... It's a very complicated organism. It's better than the cameras that we have created. It's, it's amazing. This is what Richard Dawkins says. <clears throat> Vision 
that is 5% as good as yours or mine is very much worth having in comparison with no vision at all. So, so is 1% vision better than total blindness? And 6% is better than 5, 7 better than 6, and so on in the gradual continuous, uh, up on the gradual continuous series. So what he's trying to say is, okay, let's assume <clears throat> that we have an organism with no vision. By mutation natural selection, one of the uh, organisms in that population develops something very, very blurry that gives him 1% of vision. That's still better than 0%. Well, that is technically true. For example, if you have a blind person, uh, you know, a blind person, and that person somehow gets to see 5% as what a normal person sees, it's still better than nothing. I mean, they will be able to distinguish shades and lights, and maybe they'll be able to go through an open door. That's still better than nothing. But the problem is, how do you explain it appearing in the first place? Because what Richard Dawkins says is this. Let's start with a simple light-sensitive cell. What's the problem with this, with this, with this saying? There is no simple light-sensitive cell. A light-sensitive cell is something very complicated. The process through which this can evolve is not from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4. It's not just... Um, increments, step. Just, just one step, you're able to achieve 1% vision. No. 1% vision is a very complicated thing because if you want to get from a cell that is not light sensitive to a cell that is light sensitive, it's not just one step. That's a lot of steps you need to take. It's not just one. And it will not happen in one step. And if it doesn't happen in one step, natural selection is not able to select it. You need several steps for that to happen, but if you need several steps, that means that it, the intermediary steps don't offer, offer any advantage, so it cannot be selected. <clears throat> and when we talk about vision, it requires multiple tissues, multiple systems. It's not just a light-sensitive tissue, because what he says, he does this. <clears throat> he says, okay, let's imagine an organism that doesn't have anything. <clears throat> then, an organism appears that have a light-sensitive spot. Um, <clears throat> notice, he doesn't explain how it appears. He just assumes it appears. Okay? And he says, okay, the organism that has the light-sensitive spot has an advantage over the other one who doesn't. That is true. But the key question is, how did that light-sensitive spot appear? You did not explain it. You just assume it. And then he goes further and says, Dawkins, I'm talking. Well, let's, let's imagine that <clears throat> that light-sensitive spot gets somehow cupped. You know, the tissue gets, gets like this, and this way the organism is now able to sense directionality of light. That's true, but how you did not explain how that get cupped. You did not explain that. You just assumed it. And when an organism doesn't have sight and all of a sudden gets a light-sensitive cell, Sight is, just, is more than just that. What you need now is a nerve cap capable to transmit. No, first of all, it's not the nerve. First of all, you need a cell that is able to transform the light into electrical energy. Okay? Then you need a nerve to transmit that electrical energy. Then you need a central system that is capable to receiving that. Then that central system needs to have the software capable of interpreting that electric signal that comes to the brain, to whatever the central system is. If you don't have all that, a simple, which doesn't exist, light-sensitive spot is of no use. Okay, let's assume that light-sensitive cell develops. So what? You still need the, the, the possibility to transform light into electrical energy. You need the nerve. You need to transmit it. You need the central nervous system. You need the possibility to interpret that and give instructions to the organism. You don't have all that when you develop just a simple light-sensitive cell, which doesn't exist, by the way. So that's what I'm trying to say. Organs are very, very complicated. They cannot be developed in simple steps because of a phenomenon that one intelligent design theorist um, described. 
This is the one, this is the phenomenon known as irreducible complexity. Irreducible complexity is what Michael Behe, he's, the, he's one of the, uh, the founders of the intelligent design movement, and he said there are some organs or organisms or systems in living cells that are so complicated that if you, rem and that they depend, and in which system all the parts depend on each other, that if you remove one part, the system collapses. Now, for example, a car, it is not a irreducible complex system because you take, up, you take the headlights off. That was still, does it still drive? It does. Okay, you, you take the taillight, you take the chairs, the seats, you take what, there's a lot of parts that you can take from it and it will still run, it will still drive. The engine probably is, uh, I mean, in its most basics, you can still take some parts from the engine, it will still run, but you get to a point to which if you take one more part, the engine will die. So that's the idea. Systems in living beings are so complex that you cannot build them one by one by one by one. And his doctoral dissertation is in the bacterial flagellum. It's this one here. Some bacteria have a flagellum at the end, which is a, basically an outboard motor. And the flagellum can spin with 100,000 RPMs, rotations per minute. And this engine can stop in a quarter of a rotation and rotate in the other direction. And this engine has about 40 parts. This, 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 this complex system here, and it is driven by a flow of acid. It's complicated, but the main idea is if you take any of the 40, 40, prote 40 or so proteins, it stops working. Now, how did this system appear by mutation and natural selection? You cannot have that because you need all the parts in the same place. He says, a system which is composed of several interacting parts and where the removal of any one of the parts causes the system to cease functioning, that's a re an irreducibly complex system. And this is the norm in nature. This is not the exception. He just happened to study this poor little bacteria with this poor little tail that spins at 100,000 RPMs. That's his doctoral dissertation. Yeah, PhDs are like that. You, you become a specialist in something so small, sometimes becomes irrelevant. But the idea is you are a specialist in, in something, and he's a specialist in bacterial flagellum. That is an irreducible complex system. You cannot make it function if you remove one part. And he also uses the example with a mouse trap. <clears throat> he says a mouse trap is an irreducibly complex system because you have the base, a spring, a hammer, a latch that keeps the hammer, and something here to put the cheese on. Okay? Have five parts. If you remove any of the parts, the system sees functioning. It's not a mousetrap anymore. Now, his critics, and especially this guy, Kent Miller, he came up with a very bright idea. He said, well, that is true. <clears throat> but even if you remove some things from the, for example, in this case, it removes this handle that holds the bar. And, and um, the hammer is always stuck to the board. He says, you could still use it as a tie clip. And he actually did that in one of the trials in which, uh, <clears throat> and we're going to talk about that in the last session, one of the trials in which intelligent design was put on stand, he came to the trial with this, with a tie pin, a tie clip made out of a <clears throat> mousetrap to show that a system can be adapted for another purpose. Okay, that is technically true. But that's not the point. Now the point is, how do you make from this, this? Not how do you make from a mousetrap a less complex system. It's how do you make from a, a less complex system 
a more complex system. Because in order to add this handle here, you need to apply information and energy. And that's not even a, it. The organism that had the other part, the other less specified part, if it adapts to a more specified part, what does it do with the functions that the other part did? Because what they do, the, um, this flagellum appears to have about 20-something proteins that are very similar to another system in another cell, which is called type 3 secretory pump. Whatever. It's a pump. It's a kind of injection. But, and they say, see, those are similar, and that's less complex. Some, so somehow, from this less complex system, which is the type 3 secretory pump, it evolved to a more complex system. Yeah, but how? That's my question. You're still missing like 20-something proteins. And if you want to put a flagellum on a bacteria that has a syringe, you have to explain how that bacteria survived without the syringe for the 20-something steps that it needed until it evolved a flagellum. And you have to explain what do you do with all the functions that the syringe was performing for the cell and how was that replaced by a flagellum, which is basically a locomotion system. So that bacteria had an injection system and evolution purportedly provided it with a locomotion system. Why and how and how is that cell going to survive? We don't know. We just found a less complex system that is similar. But the, that does not solve the problem. It does not solve the problem of irreducible complexity because that system in itself, type 3 secretory pump, is an irreducibly complex system in itself. So basically, you do not have a way of getting from the one to the other. You just have both of them and then you provide an interpretation. That's not proof. It's an interpretation. Ken's Miller interpretation is valid. It's not true, in my opinion, but it's valid. But it's just that, an interpretation. It is not proof. We get to what we discussed earlier. Argument from ignorance, <clears throat> this is what they say. Well, bec just because you don't know of a natural system to create information and all the complex systems, it doesn't mean we were created. And that is true. It doesn't mean it. But that's not the argument from ignorance. <clears throat> in the argument from ignorance, for example, in the 16th century, <clears throat> They said that it is God who makes blood flow through the human body. It is God directly. Somehow, he makes the blood flow through the human body. Um, however, when they discovered the heart, and they realized, oh, wait, the heart actually pumps the blood. Then they don't, didn't need God anymore. So that was the whole argument, the God of the gaps argument, argument from ignorance. We put God into the gaps in our knowledge, and when we fill those gap, gaps with knowledge, we don't need God anymore. That's not the case. Because the more we study about this, the more mysteries we find. Like I said uh, last time, the more we study about the cells, the more we find more and even more complex systems, like the highways and the trucks that are transporting substances on the highways in the cell. They didn't know about those 20 years ago. It's just something new. The more we study, the more complex systems we find, and the more we need to explain them. And now the idea is this. The people, and we're going to talk about this in the last presentation. <clears throat> the people who... Intelligent design movement, okay? The people who, who agree with that. They don't necessarily say that the designer is the god of the Bible. Most of them believe that, but not all of them. And that's not their point. It could be a very advanced alien civilization. It could be. That's the whole point. We cannot establish through science who the designer, creator is. We need some other information. Like I said, philosophy, religion, discuss that. But through science, we cannot discern who the creator is. It can be a very advanced alien civilization. So if you, if you don't want to believe in a creator, that's fine. But you have to look at the evidence and see that the evidence 
point to somebody having created life on earth. Who that somebody is, we cannot find out through science. We need something else. But I, I can say it is a very advanced alien um, civilization. I'm not involving the supernatural here. How, now, the question is, how did that very advanced alien civilization appear? Well, that's another question, which we need to address it. But my answer is valid. It can be that, and it's not supernatural. So when people say that intelligent design is religion and evolution is science, that is not true. Because the intelligent designer could be an alien civilization. It could be. We don't know who it is. And that's the whole point. We cannot discern it through science. But you look at the evidence, and the evidence points to the fact that life on Earth was created by an intelligence. Because it's too complex to have arisen through the methods of naturalism, which is mutation and natural selection. So let's try to form some conclusions. Um, homology is not proof. All the resemblances that a scientist are pointing to as proof of evolution is not proof. That's just the interpretation. Now, the resemblance itself is the data. Why, the inter why there is resemblance, that's the interpretation. Okay, that's not the proof. Mutations never provide something positive. Most mutations are negative. Some are neutral. There are no positive mutations. Right? It just doesn't exist. Even those mutations that are described to, have to be positive mutations, they prove to not be positive mutations. And that's not even the point. The point is, because of the whole diversity of life, we should be finding scores of positive mutations because they must have happened all the time. If you're just finding one, let's say you find one and all the others are negative, that doesn't prove anything. You need to be finding them everywhere because that's basically what they say that is the engine of life. It's mutations. That doesn't happen. Natural selection it just eliminates the bad. It does not create the good. Supposedly, the mutation must create the good so that the natural selection eliminates the rest. But we found out that mutation does not create the good and not, neither does natural selection. Natural selection just eliminates. It doesn't create anything. It just deals with what it has and it sifts through those. It does not create anything, okay? And irreducible complexity is not an argument from ignorance because the more we study, the more we see that the things that we study are more and more complex. Uh, they require more steps. And the more we study, we see complex systems in complex systems. And when we get, we cannot show that a single cell appeared by chance, okay, but by naturalistic process. Let's not call it chance because it's, it's a tricky answer. We'll deal with that later uh, in, a, in a different um, presentation. But when you get to, to organisms that's increasing levels of complexity, a simple cell, it is, is very, very complex. A tissue is even more complex. An organ is even more complex than that. And an organism, an organism is the most complex thing of all. And all that you need to explain through naturalistic processes. There is no answer. The only answer is when you exclude, like I said in the first presentation, when you exclude the option of a designer from the beginning, you are only left with the option of evolution. There is no other option. So the saying is, we don't have all the answers, but this is the best answer we can offer. That's not true. The best answer you can offer is the fact that we were created. We don't know by who, and we don't know by how, but that's the best answer. You just choose to discard it from the start because you don't like the philosophical implications. And that's fine, but admit it. So this way I'm trying to conclude my presentation tonight. Life is just too complex to have arisen by naturalistic processes. The more we study, the more we see is even more complex. And an honest researcher 
who wants to find the truth, even he or she doesn't like the implications, you look at the evidence and you see it is more likely that we were created than that we evolved. Thank you. Are there any questions for tonight's presentation? <clears throat> I sure hope, um, I'm going to say something. I have a very friendly audience, okay? So I, I know that most, if not even all of the audience, agree with what I'm saying. So I don't really get tough questions. I really hope that I had some unfriendly people in the audience that would <laughs> ask the questions that need to be asked, because I know the questions, and they ask them all the time. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry? Facebook. Facebook. I don't have my phone, but I don't. Could you bring my phone, please? It's right there. That's my phone. We'll see. If not, I will, if, if, if I don't get a tough question, then, thank you, Danny. Um, no questions. If I don't get a tough question, then I should be able, I, I should be forced to ask the tough questions because there are questions that we will be asked, like, like the one with the God of the gaps. And uh, intelligent design is not a God of the gaps because, the, as I said, the more we study, the more we find, it's even more and more and more complex. Anyways, any other question that you might have? Try to find, try to poke holes in my theory. That's the whole point. I had a teacher in, in my, in my um, bachelor's degree who said that even if you agree with somebody, even if you agree with somebody, try to poke holes in his theory. theory. Try to see, try to say something to, to contradict that person. This way you at least, uh, you know, exercise your mind, you know. You clean the pipe here, the pipes up here. So if you have a question, uh, try to say that I, I, did, I said something that is not true. But if we don't have any questions, then yes, Michael. Okay. Hey, cool. It's even today. It, 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 even though it's incorrect, it, it promotes, um, I think they feel like it promotes, um, um, I the right word, but actually, it actually builds on their, it gets the idea across more yeah. than proving anything. And that's why, and there's several like that, I think they have. Oh yeah, uh, there's a very good book by Jonathan Wells, which is called Icons of Evolution in which he takes these icons, things that are in the textbooks, and he shows that most of them are fake, some of them are even frauds, and some are mistakes, but they, kept, they are used continuously in the textbooks. And he even uses, because one of the, the arguments that the editors have is, well, this is a textbook, it is very good to, ch very difficult to change, science changes very rapidly, so we do not keep up with science. That's not necessarily true because he points out a mistake in a science, another science textbook in which two photos were um, incorrectly captioned. You know, there was a, a girl with a microphone and they referred to the girl as being the microphone. And he says, next year, they corrected that change immediately. There's no problem about that. However, these changes never get corrected. And now he has another book written 10 years after the fir first one who is called uh, Zombie Science. They keep coming back. That's any more icons of evolution. And the majority of his critics never address the issues. They just attack Wells, but they do not address the issues that he's mentioning in his book. Sebi, you had a question. Yeah. Uh, okay. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Uh, you, as you were talking, I caught the moment where you said that um, evolution itself is flawed, but the idea of having a creator, we don't know exactly who that creator is or what that creator is. It could even be a species of aliens like yeah. from outer space. What if a evolutionist would approach you in a way that would, would sound like the Big Bang itself was that intelligent? 
Well, the Big Bang cannot be intelligent because that is a natural process. And the, the thing is, we don't know how God created the whole universe. We don't really know through what process he created the universe because the Bible does not talk about that. <clears throat> when, we're talk, when we see the Bible, the Bible says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now when that beginning was, and what the heavens and the earth mean there, as things that we could discuss all night. So the Bible doesn't talk about that. The thing is, <clears throat> the Big Bang all by itself, I mean the naturalistic Big Bang, which is, there was nothing, no space, no time, and all of a sudden, everything was. You know, in, in an infinitesimal point, all the particles in the universe, and they just spread it. Well, okay, but you didn't explain how, you didn't prove anything. It's just the only explanation you have because you exclude a creator. So that's what the explanation that you're going to stick with. The Big Bang cannot be the intelligence. It's a naturalistic process. And uh, last time I talked about the entropic principle, the fact that the constants in the universe are so finely tuned that if you move one to the left or to the right, the universe as we know it would not exist. And they say, well, then there's an infinity of big bangs and big crunches. You know, the universe expands and then it reaches a point, it comes back to, a point, to an infinitesimal point, then it expands again and it comes back again and expands again. And in an infinity of cycles, one of them is bound to have the right rules. That's what they say. Okay, I say, okay, it's a plausible explanation, maybe, but it's no proof. It's just a belief that you have. And I choose to believe in a creator because it's more plausible than your theory of multiverse. Multiverse theory, that's what it's called in many universes. I hope I have answered your question. Joseph, Pastor Joe, ask away. Suppose there is no Bible. Okay. <clears throat> and you have the two theories face to face. Yes. Very good question. Thank you. Suppose there is no Bible. That's the whole point. I, in, in all my theory, I do not presuppose the Bible. I never used the Bible in all this. Because when I'm talking to people that do not believe the, in the Bible, there's no use in bringing the Bible because that's not an authority with, for them. For example, there was, it's a very instructive um, debate that happened about four years ago between Ken Ham, which is the director of Answer in Genesis, and Bill Nye, the science guy, a guy who believes in evolution. And they were discussing, very interesting, I happened to agree with Ken some on some, on some things, but on most I did not agree with him because he used an authority that did not exist for Bill Nye. And in the end, Bill Nye asked him, Mr. Ken Ham, why do you believe in that? How, do, how can you explain to me? And Ken Ham went on and saying, Well, Mr. Nye, I believe there is a God. And I believe that God inspired the Bible. And I believe that the Bible is the Word of God. Okay, I believe that too. But Bill Nye did not believe it. So how can you bring the Bible as an authority to a person who does not believe in the Bible? So now, we'll take the Bible aside because we're studying nature here. Okay, I believe the Bible is the inspired word of God, and I believe that God is the creator of the world. But I cannot talk to a person who doesn't believe in the Bible and point them to that, because it would mean nothing to them. For them, the Bible is just a collection of fables, of myths. And I say, okay, forget about the Bible. Okay, let's forget about the Bible. Let's look at nature. What is more likely? Okay, you look at all the intricacies of nature. You look at all the complex systems. You see that those systems cannot be formed step by step. And I think uh, the evolution is kryptonite, if I may say so. You know what kryptonite is? Yeah, everybody's familiar with Superman. Kryptonite is the stone that took all his powers and all that. So the evolution is <clears throat> kryptonite is information. You have basically instructions in living beings. That's the whole miracle. There's a language there with machines capable to read the language, translate the language, perform the instructions, and do the things that they say. 
So when I look at that in nature, disregarding the Bible, I don't know who the creator is. I don't know if there is a creator. I'm looking at it and I say, there must be somebody. I don't know who that somebody is because I, I cannot discern it from science, but there must be an intelligence. There is no other reasonable explanation. There must be one. That, of course, if we allow it in the start, because that's the whole problem. The whole problem is, whenever you talk about intel an, an intelligent designer, uh, people who don't believe in that will say, that's not science, that's religion. And I don't agree, I don't agree with that. The science of origins is different. We are talking about a unique, unrepeatable event. You must be willing to allow some things out of nature because you don't know. If you just assume something from the start, you might not get the correct answer. So my whole point is this. <clears throat> Through what I'm saying here, I am not proving the creator of the Bible because I cannot do that from science. What I can show is it is more likely that there is a designer than not. Who that designer is is the topic of a whole different presentation. Okay. Follow up. Okay. What is the ethical implication of choosing one over the other from the theory? The ethical implications. Well, the ethical implications of a naturalistic system, um, a system um, I think, are obvious. Basically, you create your own morality. Now, the ethical implication of a interventionist system, let me call it this way, that is somebody from outside intervened, okay? Um, they can be different. They do not necessarily have to be the Judeo-Christian morality. It can, be, it can be different. But then, that's what I'm saying. When we talk about origins, we cannot be fixated only on science. We have to bring philosophy, religion, theology, and all the disciplines of the search of knowledge, okay, of, uh, what's that called? Ah, the, the word escapes me. Now, the, the discipline of philosophy that deals with knowledge. Anyways, it'll, it'll come to me. You have to involve all the disciplines because there's no way of, 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 of investigating that. Epistemology. Epistemology, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, there's no way of investigating that. How are you going to put the origins in the lab. You can't. You just need to think about it, reason about it, and come up with the better, the best answer that you can. Follow up to follow up, please. So, the, the reason I'm asking this question is, it seems to me that going from this approach, okay. you force human mind to think there must be something beyond myself. Okay. So it's, it's an inductive way to kind of entertain a discussion, a conversation with somebody that is an unbeliever or, or agnostic or whatever, uh, to, to go one step further and say, okay, so what, see, there are, there's a line of arguments in this direction. Why wouldn't you consider this? And then from that step on, you may, you may uh, need faith. Well, that, that's exactly what I'm trying to say. That, that, that you, you, you nailed it. I mean, it's exactly what I'm trying to point. I do not talk about the Bible because they will not accept it anyways. Let's look at the evidence. And I want to find out the truth. If the evidence shows to me that there is no creator, I must follow the evidence. But I look at the evidence and it is obvious that there's somebody beyond all this. You cannot have naturalistic processes creating information. There is no case. Because information, by definition, requires an intelligence who assigns meaning to something. Information is assigned. It's not something that appears naturally. It's put in there arbitrarily by somebody that wants that meaning to be there. So when I talk to somebody who does not believe in, 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 in the Bible, I do not discuss the Bible. I look at the evidence. And I believe, I believe, it is more likely that we were somehow designed than not. The evidence shows that. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much for your questions. Yes, Sebi? <clears throat>
positive. Okay. Uh, what's the difference between uh, mutations and microevolution, which a lot of creationists actually agree upon adaptation to periodic? Okay, may maybe the wording on the point number two is, is unfortunate. What I wanted to say, there are no positive mutations that, that uh, offer something better than what it existed. Microevolution is true. You can see it. It's not something you can deny because you effectively see it. Microevolution means that some uh, the organisms change and they're different than what they used to be and the color of their skin changes, the color of the fur changes. But the point is all those things were in the genetic code and through recombination and all that. But you don't ha ever have a mutation that provides an advantage to the organism. Everything that exists, exists through recombination and, and other, other uh, genetic processes. But a mutation, by definition, is, a, is an error in the genetic code. And errors do not create advantages. Errors provide only disadvantages. Although there might be some minor advantages, like uh, we had with the sickle cell anemia, uh, and as a creationist, I don't necessarily l agree with everything he says, and we're going to try to end this, uh, Kent Hovind, but he had a very interesting way of putting this. He said, sickle cell anemia is like saying uh, uh, that provides an advantage because you cannot get an athlete's foot because you, your leg is amputated. So, yeah, your leg is amputated. Of course you cannot get athlete's foot, but what's the biggest disadvantage? Having athlete's foot and a leg or not having athlete's foot and no leg? So that's basically the whole point. You know, sickle cell anemia provides some protection against malaria. Okay, that's true, but it creates a whole lot of problems. And most people who have sickle cell anemia die much younger than the people who don't. And that in the case of modern medicine, because without modern medicine, there's not even a discussion there. Thank you. Okay, um, let us continue in this search for truth. We want to look for the truth. Next time, we're going to be dealing with the age of the earth, the testimony of the past, fossils, and geologic ages. That's, a, that's an area where people of faith still have, still, still have questions that are answered. And that's fine. We still need to learn to live with uncertainties. It's a part of the maturity of faith. We will not have all questions answered. Thank you for those pre to those present here, and uh, we'll have a fellowship just like last time. Uh, there are things that is wait are waiting for us in the back, for young games for everybody, refreshments and everything if you want to stay, and hope to see you again next week for our fourth installment of this series. Have a good night.